wonder what it would be like to be born in a manger. Yeah. Wonder what ever happened to baby Jesus. He, he grew up. What? Wait. So you're saying that the baby Jesus Christmas story is the same as the adult walk on water Jesus? Yeah. Thanks, honey. Wow, I just never really put the two concepts together. <laughs> Wonder what happened to that guy, huh? <laughs> he... he went to the cross. That's the same guy? Yeah. So what you're saying is baby Jesus is the same as cross Jesus? Yeah. I mean, there's some time in there, right? I mean, he... he grew up, he... I mean, there's some time in there, right? I mean, he... He grew up, he taught people, he lived a perfect life, he died on the cross and came back to life, and, you know, now he lives in our hearts. That's the same guy? The Jesus that lives in our hearts? <sighs> okay, I was really, oh, wow. Okay. I never really put all those guys together, you know? Only one guy. I tell you this, there's an idea. Maybe we stop just making Christmas all just this once a year isolated thing, but we make it an ongoing story about the salvation in our hearts and lives. It's the idea. God, you threw the whole world a curveball when you showed us a kind of hope we'd never thought to look for. Born of poverty, between the walls of a rickety barn and into the fragile arms of a nervous young mom, Jesus arrived unable to defend himself, much less anyone else. We'd been hoping for security, and you gave us a baby. And then, the expectations kept being shattered. Jesus healed those who could do nothing for him. He handed out hope to people the world turned away. Jesus showed us a new way of life. A life that works from the inside out. 
hope lives with us, then inside us and moves from our hearts into the world. Jesus gave us hope beyond this life. Hope no one else has to give. Hope that shows up in a manger is a gift we don't deserve, but we gratefully receive. We call him Jesus. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. that you have chosen to worship with us this morning. Hey, no matter what we're facing this season, 2 Corinthians says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Amen. Come on, sing this with us. Step out of the shadows. Step out of the grave. Break into the wild. Don't be afraid. Shake. 
God, uh, as we meet here this morning, we're not coming here to just perform some religious activity or to tick a box off on the spiritual practices. God, we are here because we want to meet with you. We long to see your glory. And we know, Lord, you want to show us. You want to show us who you are. You want, you want to show us the depth of your love for us. So, God, we come here to experience you, to encounter you, to meet with you, the living God, our creator, our savior, the lover of our souls this morning. God, may our hearts and our minds be just wide open, wide open for what you want to speak into our hearts and our lives today in this time we have together. And we pray this in the name of the precious Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen, church. Amen. Isn't it good to be together on this Sunday morning? As you're taking a seat, why, why don't you, who here, you've been, Jesus has changed some things in your life. Can you say that? Has Jesus changed it? So as you have a seat, just say to the person next to you, you're about to be changed. You're about to be changed. No, he's done amazing, amazing things in my life. I'm so grateful for all the changes. So welcome everyone, but especially if today's your first time here at FCF Church, we are so excited that you've chosen to spend your Sunday morning with us. Can we let them know how excited we are? We're excited, we are honored, we're really excited for what we believe God has in store for you. So we're hoping today is a great experience for you. Uh, we would love to know that you're with us if it's your first time, whether you're in person or you're online out there. And you can let us know by filling out our Connect card. It's inside your program in the auditorium. Or uh, if you're online, just go to fcfchurch.com and tap the Connect button. We'd really appreciate that. So we've got a lot of really cool things happening this holiday season. It's been so excited. Last night was incredible. Our Christmas walk, who experienced that with us last night? We had almost 800 people register for the Christmas walk this year. And we want to give a special shout out and thank you to Debbie McCroy, Christine Durling, and Pastor Reuben for leading the charge and all that they did. But for all of the volunteers that made it happen, there were so many. We're so grateful. It was just a great experience. So thanks for helping make it happen and for all those who came and participated. It was great. So we've got some other cool things coming around the corner. You might have seen out in the lobby a table set up by the door. That's for what we call help for the hungry. For over 20 years, FCF Church has provided Christmas dinner on Christmas Day at the rescue mission, which feeds a couple hundred people in our community on Christmas morning, on Christmas day. So again, we've done that for over 20 years as a church. It's incredible and in providing that much food. So if you want to be part of that, just meet them in the lobby. You can get an assignment. Some people make a dish to take others. You're maybe just providing part of the meal, something you just pick up and purchase and drop off. So we'd love you to have, love to have you be a part of that. Now, Christmas kind of falls at funny times this year, so we want to just get our uh, Christmas schedule out and clear for everybody, our holiday schedule. First of all, Christmas Eve service. It's on a Saturday, so our services are two and four. Two and four. Two and four. Can everybody say that? Two and four. Since it's a Saturday, we moved them up a little bit earlier. So we hope to see you at one of those, and that you'll bring somebody with you too. Christmas Sunday, Christmas falls on a Sunday this year. 
So we are doing an online service only. Don't show up in person, okay? But we are providing an online service, and that will uh, come out on Facebook and YouTube at 11.15. Now, you can watch it any time during the day that day, but we really encourage you as a church family, join us online at 11.15, and we can have that sense of still all being together. New Year's Day falls on a Sunday, so we know you might be up late. We're going to have one service in person, so come on out, New Year's Day, and that will be at 11.15. Everybody got all that straight? It's on your program, so check it out. So, Pastor Pete, there's been like some stuff going on. You what? <laughs> you're saying you're like so? There, there have been a lot of things going on within the facilities, what you're going to say, right? Yeah, when you walk up, it's beautiful out there at those steps when you come in. We wanted to give a special shout out to a couple of different people who have been, they don't just have a, a heart for the kingdom of God, they have a heart for the house of God, amen. I want to thank Broadhurst for construction, Glenn Kelly, Arc, Arc Flory for putting in new carpet, new putting carpet. in retaining walls that are out there. And then we had someone ask about the two new buildings that we put up out front. Those have actually been renovated by people within the church. Can you volunteers. let all those volunteers know how much you appreciate them? Or Incredible. They're making the impact they have. Yeah. Yeah, just people stepping up, just doing stuff for our church. And if you notice the new carpet coming in and uh, just saving us great amounts of money. So, and, and it's beautiful when you walk up the stairs coming in. So thank you so much. And you know why these, these people step up to do this? Because they got a yes in their spirit. You know, last week we talked about Corinthians. And it said, uh, Apostle Paul says, the yes to all of God's promises is in Christ. And through Christ, we say yes to the glory of God. So when we have a yes in our spirit, we want to be part of all that God is doing in and through his church. And so we hope that you have a yes in your spirit. And if you want to say yes and express your re uh, yes through your giving, you can give online on, the, on our website, uh, utilizing the offering boxes or the FCF app. Today, you're in for a treat. It's going to be awesome. Pastor Pete is bringing message number two in our series, Nativity Singularity. Good morning. My name is Pete, and I have the incredible privilege of serving here as the associate pastor at FCF Church. If you're a first-time guest, following service this morning, I'd love to have the opportunity to meet you over here in Guest Central, give you a chance to ask any questions you have about the church and get to know us a little bit better. Last Saturday, we did an event called Heart for the Hurting, and we were, it, we were blown away by the response. And I want to let you know those that served that event is still having an effect. On Monday, Carroll County Department of Human Services showed up to pick up their boxes. Now, they had 190 gifts and were under the impression that the gifts were small. And they showed up in a small four-door car. <laughs> and they were completely blown away. They said that next year they will be open on Saturday to receive gifts. So give yourselves a hand. You're a blessing. You're an incredible job. Thank you for serving. Last week, Pastor Kim launched our new series, Nativity Singularity, and next week, Pastor Randy will complete the series. I have the privilege of saying, sharing here in the middle. Can you let Pastor Kim know what an incredible job she did, how much you appreciate her and love her? Now, despite my better judgment, I'm going to show a video this morning. Um, Pastor Kim is, is convinced that you are all going to make fun of me for this video. Um, 
I'm going to show you the video of how Jessica and I announced that we were having our first child. And uh, she said I looked like a small bearded child, I believe is what she said when she told the staff. And that you would make fun of me for this video. Now what I said, I defended you good people. I said you would not do this, that you were, you were kind, gentle-hearted, uh, rich in mercy, abounding in love, and that you would not make fun of me for cutting my beard too close to my face, for uh, wearing a suit to try to look older. So you're not going to do that, right? Oof. Hung jury. <laughs> Let's check it out anyway. We've had the privilege of serving at Calvary for yeah! almost seven years, something like that. And we, we love you guys. Um, we consider you our family, and we've enjoyed serving here. Um, and I thought that would be the funniest way to tell you guys that we're having a baby. But what we actually did is because it was the holiday season, we took a, a bracelet box, put the pregnancy test in it, and gave it to a couple of our relatives, and we made a little video for you guys. Check out what I got Jesse. I got her a present for Christmas. We love you, Jesse. I wish it was already next week so I could hug you. Okay, you ready? Oh, 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 I hope you like it. I was ready for the spring. What? Really? Yeah! Oh, 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 I don't think I look that different. It's like looking in a mirror. But I show that video because who you tell, how you tell, and, and what you tell them has a lot to do with your personality. It shows your character, your nature, who you are. So keep that in mind. Let's look here at Luke 2, starting at verse 8. It says this, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And behold, the angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, King James Version says, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you, what is it? Good tidings of, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. Anybody like Charlie Brown Christmas? Where are my Charlie Brown Christmas people at? My man Linus. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. Love that guy. <laughs> this was monumental news that split recorded history. Time as we know it from this point would forever pivot. An enormous event. It was the celestial coming in contact with the terrestrial. And God pulls back the curtain of heaven and shows us a picture of the heavenly realm. Majesty, power, beauty. Everything before led to it, and everything since looks back at it. But this announcement comes to shepherds in a field. Now, people can't agree, but there's somewhere between 150 million and 300 million people on earth at this point. 
This date is so monumental, it changes everything. But was this just a coincidental, insignificant detail of the story that it came to shepherds? I mean, why does Luke take time to share this detail? You may say it's just they happened to be there, like the baby was born here and the shepherds were here. I, I don't believe so. These were angels, right? The, Jerusalem is five miles. This is the religious epicenter of the world. There's palaces, synagogues, temples. These are angels. I believe this was a deliberate and calculated decision and allows us to see directly into the heart of God. It was majesty and obscurity coming together. I believe this was the unfolding of God's perfect plan to fully reveal his heart and regain the trust that was broken in the garden. This was so impactful. But to a first century religious leader, this story gets off to a horrible start. The Messiah, born in a manger. There, no, no silk sheets, satin pillow, gold-leafed crib. This was not a good look. But somehow, this is how God decides to reveal himself. Excuse me, this is how God decides to reveal himself. The angels don't fly into the palace and say, baby, Jesus was born, eight pounds, six ounces, and 21 inches of delightful godliness. <laughs> he smells like peppermint. <laughs> no, it's a feeding trough. And the announcement comes to shepherds. Now this already sounds pretty rough, but what if I told you that it's probably worse than you realize? There's probably context that you're not familiar with. How many of you know a first century shepherd? That's what I thought. So I want to give you some context for what we know about shepherds, because this may surprise you. The first thing that we know is, is that the first century shepherds, this seemed unworthy. I mean, for them to receive this knowledge didn't make any sense to anybody. They're insignificant, or if you're Pastor Randy a couple weeks ago, unsignificant, right? They didn't matter to culture. They were hired hands, or if they weren't a hired hand, they were the youngest in the family, like David. Remember, David, David comes, Jesse shows up at Jesse, excuse me, Sam, Samuel shows up at Jesse's house to get the king and anoint him, and instead, instead of David being there, they... They forget it even exists. Samuel says, he's not here. Who, who is it? Where are they? He says, you know, I think, I think I have one more kid. He's out watching the sheep. So they bring him in. These people didn't matter. And I imagine in these situations, I like to put myself right in the middle of them. Pastor Randy asks us to do this all the time. He asks us to step out of where we are and step into the context of this story. And you have these seemingly insignificant shepherds. And an angel appears to them. And what must go th through their head is, he knows, he sees, we matter. Maybe for the first time in their life, they feel like they had some sort of significance. What's the second thing we know? We know that they were uneducated. They weren't the best of the best. They were a part of the agrarian culture. They were blue-collar workers. They probably lacked some social couth. Most scholars believe that these shepherds were most likely illiterate. They couldn't read or write. I mean, this will blow up everything you believe about who you're recruiting into ministry, right? What's the next thing that we know? They appeared unethical. Now, this is probably the one that's going to throw the most of you. I put appeared in there to try to soften it for you, but there's really no softening it. These were roughneck guys or girls. Eyewitness accounts given by shepherds weren't admissible in the court of law. So if you were a shepherd and you witnessed a crime, you were believed to be so unethical that they would not consider your testimony valid. 
They believed to be corrupt, dishonest, shady, fraudulent. The Romans despised them. They were almost seen as gypsies. They were very nomadic and they traveled. One prominent third century rabbi said that they were loathsome individuals. Shepherds. Which in these situations always makes me wonder, what were the shepherds doing before the angel showed up? What, what was going on in that moment and in those times? I picture, you know, they're there. Well, I'm smoking a cigarette. Angel shows up, he drops it, kicks it behind him, turns his head around. <laughs> Ever catch your kids doing something they should have been doing? Anybody here? Just me. I'm the only one. Yeah, it seems unlikely. <laughs> like two nights ago, two or three nights ago, we told our kids to go to bed. It was super late. We put our tree up, and so they're just, I mean, the Christmas joy is just bubbling out of them. They're so stinking excited. So they're bouncing off. The, we hear them literally bouncing off the walls. Do-do-do-do, bang, hitting the walls. And so I come, I'm like, guys, go to bed, or you're going to get spank spanked. Do you want spank spank? No, okay, go to bed. A couple minutes later, I hear him. And I, I get out of bed, come in, throw on the light switch, and Ethan knows. I mean, he's busted. Daniel is mid-pillow fight swing. <laughs> like he is, yeah, and the light goes on, and Ethan, in shame, just bows his head before the Lord. Just <laughs> now, Daniel is now under the impression that he is able to beat the speed of light and get back into his bed before I notice. So he dives. <laughs> what were these... What were these shepherds doing? What happened before that point? The last thing we know is this. They were considered unclean. Now, you're probably thinking about this from a physical perspective, that they were dirty or smelly, and, and they were part of the agrarian workforce. So they were physically dirty. Sheep have a smell. I have a picture of me holding a sheep overseas, and I'm a little kid, and I've humiliated myself enough tonight, so I'm not going to this morning. I'm not going to put another picture to make, allow you to make fun of me for it, but yes, I know. <laughs> but that's not what I'm referring to. I'm not referring to physical cleanliness. These men couldn't follow the cleanliness laws that were outlined by Scripture. So because of that, they couldn't participate in temple worship. Shepherds outside of Bethlehem were raising sheep for temple worship, but they were not able to participate in the worship they were providing the sheep for. What I'm saying with this is shepherds were categorically removed from the religious community and fundamentally rejected by first century religious leaders. They were outsiders. For a lot of you, when I say shepherds, you think Adorable kid holding a crook wearing his father's bathrobe. Oh, they're cuddly, they're adorable, they're sweet. But shepherds didn't make this story cuddly. They, they made it revolutionary. They changed everything. There's been 400 years of silence and God breaks the silence with angels revealing themselves to shepherds and the heralding of Christ's birth doesn't come to the religious elite. It comes to humble, insignificant, unqualified, uneducated shepherds. And maybe you'd say, Pete, you're getting ahead of yourself. Again, this was just a coincidence. I mean, this could have... The, Bethlehem was here. The shepherds were there. They, they just happened to be close enough to each other. That's why it happened. It's a coincidence. But God ordained every single aspect of his son's birth prophesied the date, the city, the time, the census, the leadership, thousands of years before. Let's look at this story. Matthew 2, 4. This is when Herod hears that the, the, the Messiah has been born and he wants to address this. He's upset. He's disturbed by it. And so he gathers all the preachers, all the priests and teachers. That's these two together as preachers, I guess, priests and teachers. But when he had called them together, all the chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them, where the Messiah was to be born. Do you know how they respond? They say, we, we don't know. I mean, how could we know where somebody's been? He could have been born anyway. It's the Messiah. Is that what they said? No. They replied, in Bethlehem of Judea. 
For this is what was, what's the word? And they quote Micah 5.2. This was not a coincidence. It was deliberate. So I would ask, why does God announce this monumental event to the shepherds? I mean, there's the John 10, 11, 11 reference, which is that Jesus is our good shepherd. David was a shepherd. Moses was a shepherd. But I believe it speaks more to the heart of God than it does the qualifications or symbolism of a shepherd. It looks directly into who he is. Let's look back at the passage. Luke 2, 10 says, Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to, what's it say? For there, in case you missed it, for there is born to this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Love this passage. Majesty revealed in obscurity. Purity presented to the unclean. Wisdom given to the uneducated. And significance shared with the seemingly insignificant. It doesn't make any sense to us. And what's God saying? It wasn't just that Jesus had come for everybody. He wanted to make it clear Jesus came for the nobody. For those that didn't matter, every culture has them. Those who are marginalized, rejected, overlooked. But this is the all-inclusive message of the gospel. Good news of great joy for everybody, but specifically for those, or especially for those who felt like a nobody. So I'd ask you, why do some reject God? It's about probably 25 years I've been outspoken about my faith and, and I've, I've invited people to church. I've, I've tried to bring people to a saving knowledge of Christ, get them to a point that they, they do it God's way. Do you know why I believe most people reject God? It's because they believe that God has already rejected them. We have a fatal combination going on inside of us of, of guilt and fear and shame. But the good news is this. I believe that the shepherds were symbolic. I believe the shepherds give us a picture of who we are. People think that God's mad at them, right? God's rejected them. But God's not mad at them. It, this isn't some, we talk about it all the time, appeasement-based theology. I got to get God off my back. I got to get him on my side. I got to do obeisance, whatever I can do to make the deity happy. But he's mad at me that I keep sinning. No, God's, God's not mad at you. He realizes that sin is killing us and he wants what's best for us. And here's what he wants you to know this morning. He's not mad at you. He came for you. Who'd he come for? He came for the unworthy. You may say, I'm nobody. I don't matter. The world is big. I'm small. I'm insignificant. I don't matter to God. You might say, you know, Pete, I never mattered in my family. I'm sure I don't matter to God. You could say, I, I never knew my earthly father, there's no way my heavenly father cares for me. I would say he knows you, he sees you, and more than any of that, he came for you. He came for the unworthy. Maybe you'd say, I'm, Pete, I'm, I'm uneducated. I'm not the best, I'm not the brightest. There's nothing special about me. Pete, look, look, in school, when I got a C, all of heaven rejoiced. God doesn't want me. I'm insignificant. I don't, I don't matter. He sent me to tell you that he came for you. 
Or maybe it's worse than that for you. You say, Pete, I'm unethical. Like I have, man, I have a past. Uh, People don't see me as a person of integrity. I've messed up so many times. If I set foot in a church, no idea. You're in good company. Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What I love is it says that all have sinned, but come on, all are welcome. The ground at the foot of the cross is level. He loves you too much to leave you in what he died to rescue you from. Come on, he's not mad at you. He loves you and he came for you. He came for you. Probably know where this is going to. Maybe you feel unclean. You say, Pete, right now, like I, I can't, I can't, I can't set foot in a church. This is probably the most common response that I've gotten when I've invited somebody to church. And some of you have experienced this same thing. So you, you, you muster the courage, you talk to somebody and you say, hey, hey, I've, I'd love for you to come to church with me. Come, come to my church. Come check it out. Just, just spend the day. Give me an hour and a half, hour and 20 minutes. We'll, we'll, we'll be at church. It'll be awesome. Come on. And I get this response all the time. They say this. Man, if, if I set foot in a church, lightning would strike. You ever hear that? That's garbage. That's not what the gospel is. That's garbage that... Churches with poor theology teach. I'll tell you right now, that's not this church. You can come as you are and you will be welcome. Amen? Amen. Come on. You think you got to get yourself, maybe you watch it online, you think I got to get myself cleaned up to come in that church. We let Nick on stage? Come on. (laughs) I gave him a break in first service. I had to, yeah, get it in there and say. <laughs> God catches his fish and then he cleans them. Come on, you don't have to get cleaned up to come to God. You can feel unethical, uneducated, unworthy and unclean. But he told me to tell you that he came for you. He came for you. God didn't just come for the good guys because guess what? None of us would be good enough. None of us would be good enough. I'll say it this way. Christ came for everybody, but especially those who feel like a nobody. Christ came for everybody, especially those who feel like a nobody. With outreach ministries, We talk about numbers. As a church grows, we talk about numbers. You know why? Because every number represents a life. Every life represents a soul. And every single soul matters to God. I'm going to say that one more time. Every single soul matters to God. 2 Peter 3.9 says that God is not being slow as some understand slowness, but he is willing that None should perish. Every single life matters to God. Anybody that tells you different is not teaching scripture. I love Christmas decorations. Uh, it's one of my favorite things in the world. Who, who else? You like Christmas decorations. Who does? My, okay. All right. But specifically for me, I like lights on a Christmas tree. And I want my Christmas tree just on the brink of combustion. I want that thing, so many lights that I can warm my hands when I come in from outside. I mean, I want, anybody else, that's you, you people wrap their, any, I want to see you, my people. These are my people. I love you. All right, don't ever change. Don't let the world change you. <laughs> However, these, here, here's the, this is these lights that we got here, right? I believe that these uh, were either invented by the devil himself or a result of the fall of man. I'm not sure which it is. But what happens if you take... Let me see if I can get one of these suckers out. Okay. What happens? You, pu- you pull, pull one ball out. I'm going to try to throw this to Bruce. Bruce, if you can catch it. 
Oh, that was close. He caught it. Give it up for Bruce, one of our elders. Good man. <laughs> we spent like four hours in here practicing that earlier. <laughs> None of that is true. He didn't know I was throwing it to him. <laughs> Listen, here's what I'm saying. You think you can exclude one bulb from this string and, and it's not going to fulfill its purpose. And if we as a church think that we can exclude any group of people, we are not going to fulfill our purpose and we certainly won't shine. Scripture calls us the light of the world. City on a hill. Uh, a light on a hill doesn't push certain people aside because they don't fit our criteria. The ground at the foot of the cross is level. Level. You can look like a church. We can have all of the elements of a church. But if we're not welcoming everyone, we will not be fulfilling our God-given purpose. So you'd say, Pete, it's not like there's a, it's, it's not that big a deal. I mean, we have, we have a lot of people in the church. Like we're doing really good. You know, if we have, let's say, 99 sheep, does one matter? Luke 15.1 says it this way. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes who? Sinners. And eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it. Verse 7 says that heaven rejoices when one comes to repentance. If I, let, if I let you watch my kids and you take care of some of them, you say, you know, that Zoe, she's delightful. And Daniel... I mean, he's incredible. He feels deep. But Ethan, he's talking to everybody. Like, he won't stop, and he's just, he's an extrovert, and so I can't keep him. Or I say, do you say you want to take him somewhere? We're going to go down to Carroll Creek and look at the boats in Carroll Creek. Fantastic. And you come back with two out of three? <laughs> no, every single life matters to God. Every single life matters to God. <laughs> this is my absolute favorite part of this story. There's so much profound knowledge in this story, but this is by far my favorite point. Look at Luke 2, 15. It says this, When the angels had left and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us... You can do better than that. Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. This is the NIV. NIV says, spread the word. Phillips says that they told everybody. Uh, the New King James Version says that they made widely known, and the original King James says they made known abroad. What did the shepherds do? You saw it a second ago. They responded. But that's still not my favorite part. I'm getting there. It's easy to hear and not respond. Lots of people hear and don't respond. I'm a husband. I do it every single day. Is she still in here? <laughs> what I love is that shepherds become the first evangelists. They're the first ones to begin to share their faith. It's because they were the, the most articulate. Probably not. They had comprehensive biblical knowledge of the law. Nope. They were by far the most qualified. Definitely not. They were willing. 
and they responded because they believed. <laughs> and if you believe something enough, you feel obligated to respond. You can't help but to respond, to share. We can't help but share when we have a restaurant that we like. We want to tell everybody. Just once I want to answer a phone during service. Man, that would be so cool. <laughs> but some information we just feel obligated to share. There's a story of, of a company called Mercedes-Benz who is about 15 years ago created a specific crash technology that arguably has saved millions and millions of lives. And they owned this technology, and instead of uh, defending the patent that they had, they allowed all other car companies to use it. It would have given them a competitive advantage. The financial loss is, is difficult to calculate. But, but Mercedes said, you know what? No, we're going to let everybody else use it. And when interviewed about it, the representative from Mercedes-Benz said it this way. They said, some information is so important that you have to share it. It's too important not to share Come on, if we believe, it's too important not to share. It's my second point. Comprehensive theological knowledge is not a prerequisite for sharing your faith. Now, just, just to be clear, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 15 says that we're to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed and correctly handles or divides the word of truth. That we know scripture, we're studying scripture, we're on a developmental journey to get better. But don't let the fact that you don't have it all figured out prevent you from sharing your faith. I just picture the shepherds like, come on, let's go check this out. And they're like, what happened? Like, we don't even know, but come on and check it out. Come to my church. What's going on? I don't know, but Pastor Pete will tell you. And goes through your head is, man, what if they ask me a question that I don't have the answer to? Like, what do I, what do, I do with that? You say this, I don't know. And then you come and you have, two things will take place. The first one is now you've begun a dialogue with someone about your faith. And the second thing is that you will grow as you learn the answer to the question. But we all want to wait till we have it all figured out. And that's not it. Here's the, here's the, the answer. God uses everyone. And everyone can reach someone. God uses everyone, and every single person in this room has a voice into someone else's life. You could say, you know, Pastor Pete, this is, this is a one-time thing. I mean, he used the shepherds, but, I mean, it was different from that point on. It's not like, it's not like that's how he selected his disciples. It's not like they were unschooled fishermen. God will use whoever is willing and able and says, here I am. What do you, what do you need, God? That you'd find me faithful. I have a, a very close friend who just, his life, again, got off to the worst possible start you can imagine. Broken home, whatever you're picturing, it was probably worse. Rough background, his family was a mess. Spent a bunch of time on the street, got in all kinds of trouble, made decisions that he would regret for the rest of his life. But at age 23, God got a hold of his heart and he said, God, I've been doing this my way for long enough and I know it doesn't work. God, I want to do this your way. And so he gave his heart to Christ. He said, God, I I'll do whatever it is that you'd have me to do. Lead me, direct me. 
Here I am. And God said this. He said, you know what? I can use a roughneck drywall hanger from Southeast Washington named Randy Goldenberg. And he went into ministry and pastored for a while. And then 30 years ago, he responded and took a step of faith and planted this church and tens of thousands of people have been affected by his faithfulness to say, God, you can use everyone. And I don't know how many I'm going to reach, but anybody you put in my path, God, I'm going to tell about you. <laughs> he felt unworthy. He felt uneducated. He had a horrible past. He didn't think God wanted anything to do with him. He was a mess. He was unclean. But he said, God, here I am. Use me. He didn't use the excuse that he wasn't good enough. There's two types of people in this room. There's those that God is calling to take a step of faith. You've been a Christ follower for a while. And you're just like, God, you, you can't use me. I don't have it all together. I'm kind, of, I'm kind of a mess. I don't even have this theology thing figured out. But I love you. And if you say to do something, I'm going to do it. If you say not to, I'm going to stop. And I want to do this your way. I've tried my way and it doesn't work. And he's telling you, you can reach somebody. You're more qualified than the shepherds probably were. They were converted and within a couple of days, they're sharing their faith. Or maybe you're in this room or you're watching online. And you, you don't want to set foot in a church because you don't feel like you're good enough. You don't feel like you matter. You feel like your life has been a mess. And he sent me to tell you that he came for you. Christ came for everybody, especially those who feel like a nobody. We're going to just take a second here, do something a little bit different. I'm going to ask the Jesse to come. And I don't want anybody moving around just for a couple of seconds. I just want you to process this because there's some people that are here or watching online and you need to hear this. Scripture tells us that he left or would leave the 99 to come for you. And I would tell you that if he would reveal himself to shepherds in a field, insignificant, unqualified, he'll reveal himself to you. You matter to him. Listen. Oh, Jesus.
we say thank you to Pastor Pete for that incredible message? Thank you for listening to God who God told you to tell us. And we so appreciate it because we needed to hear that today. Uh, you know, last week, uh, Pastor Randy, he gave me the word profundity. Pastor Pete got a better word, don't you think, obscurity. Next week, Pastor Randy's going to talk to us in the last message in the series, vulnerability. So let's be shepherds this week and let's go spread the word and invite some people to come and hear what God wants to speak to them, okay? Amen, church? Are you with me? All right. If today's your first time here at FCF Church, Pastor Pete is waiting over in Guest Central. He would love to meet you personally, shake your hand, and learn a little bit about you. And Care Central is open for anyone you need to talk or pray with someone because you got that struggle of feeling like a nobody. We'd love to spend some time with you today, whatever you're going through. Take care. See you next week, church. Have a great Sunday.